My name is Maria Hinojosa. Um, it's great to be here. I've reintegrated with my jet lag, so I'm very, very happy. I'm going to ask my panelists to come up one by one, and they're going to actually introduce themselves because I actually hate it when people read the long bios, and so we don't want to really spend too much time there. But the question I'm going to ask them is, so far, what has been their favorite, favorite moment in Oxford? I mean, Rana kind of lives here, so, you know, it's uh, different. But my favorite moment so far was eating in the turf bar last night and having bait camembert with olives that had, like, honey injected into them. If anybody knows, it is now on my top 25 favorite dishes in the world, and it happened here at Oxford at the Skull World Forum, so I'm very excited. Erin, come up, introduce yourself, tell us what you do and what your favorite moment so far has been. Hi, everyone. I'm Erin Velarde, the founder of Vote Run Lead. Um, my life's work has been women's political representation in the U.S. Um, my favorite political moment was Despacito yesterday. Oh. I was like in row five or six and watching Tim rock out and some folks at Skoll that I was uh, quite surprised with their moves. I love yeah. that. I love that. Luis is a real sweet guy also for having the biggest hit. Oh. He's completely, completely dumber. Rana, it's such an honor to have you here. Tell us, introduce yourself. And your favorite moment so far? Uh, my, my name is Rana. I am an Iranian journalist. I have been working for the BBC for the last 15 years, and I obviously cover Iran prominently in Persian for uh, spe uh, Persian speakers who live in Iran and Afghanistan and across the world, but I also cover Iran in English for the rest of the world. Um, Meeting so many people who are doing so much good, it was uh, very uplifting. But on top of that, having a sunny day yesterday, living yeah. here, just seeing the sun, it just, <laughs> it's so rare and so beautiful. Just look at that, how, how grim it is today. So, so far, those two. All right, love it. Alessandra, <laughs> a você. Hi everyone, I'm Alessandra Rofino. I work with activists and community organizers in Brazil, helping them be more effective advocates for their communities and win policy wins, get new public services into their communities all over the country. And it's a pleasure to be here. You stole my moment. Tim dancing to Despacito. <laughs> I mean, you can't really top that. No. That was just too much. Yeah, great. it was incredible. So that's it. I can't, I, you can't really go over that. Great. And finally, finally Lin Yue. Feel my dress catch it. All good. <laughs> ah, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Lindy Mazivugo. I am the co founder and CEO of Future Elect. Um, we are a nonpartisan political leadership development incubator in Africa, Southern Africa, soon to be East Africa, and next year in the ECOWAS region. I'm also a former politician. I used to be the leader of our position in parliament in South Africa. Um, and I'm deeply passionate about getting more young people, more women who were like me at the time, running for office and being um, the voice of uh, leadership in Africa. The best thing about this week for me was a generalized experience of how many people I know just hugging people in the streets, mm. like, you know. Uh, every time I turn a corner, there's somebody I haven't seen before, for year, seen for years, or people I have been talking to on Zoom since the pandemic, but I'm only seeing live for the first time. So that's been the most special oh, part. Wonderful, great. All right, so I told my panelists that in order to make me really happy as a moderator, their job is to interrupt each other. <laughs> because we really want to make this into a conversation as if we were sitting with a bottle of vino. something else, vino, <laughs> um, to have a, yeah, a serious but joyful conversation. Um, so I'm just going to be very honest with you. As a journalist, that's all I can be. Recently, um, I've been covering the a massacre in Uvalde, Texas. Mm -hmm. This is the second worst school massacre in the United States in Uvalde, Texas. Um, and so, and I'm covering some other stories that are just really like dark. And I've been feeling, a, you know, trying to take on these, these powerful institutions like the Border Patrol, Immigration, now even the DEA, and just feeling overwhelmed by the state of corruption. And, but then, the truth is, is that if we don't find a way to understand that we cannot stop that of course there are going to be moments in our life when we're just going to feel overwhelmed by the structuralness of it. And so to me, most recently, it's been about understanding 
how important it is for us not to give up, mm. specifically on democracy. Mm -hmm. When so many people, we hear this, I'm, yeah, nothing more to be done, I'm done, I'm over it. So let's just start with what keeps you inspired in this moment. Maybe you want to speci specify it to a person, um, in my case, in Uvalde, like a massacre, right? But there's actually an extraordinary story of hope and democracy in Uvalde because there's a little girl by the name of Caitlin who we're profiling. So the documentary on Frontline will be out at the end of May on Latino USA will be out on podcast at the end of May. This little girl who is a survivor of the massacre has become an authentic and organic leader who speaks back to the chief of police. She goes to the state capitol and is waving a, wagging a finger at the governor of the state of Texas. And she's also a great dancer, TikTok dancer. So she has me dancing to TikTok while we're interviewing her, which is so uplifting. And you wouldn't expect that necessarily from what might happen after a massacre. Mm -hmm. So actually, let's start with you, Rana, because it's the most kind of in, in our heart moment, what's happening mm -hmm. in Iran and the fact that so many of us don't know. Can you just tell us as if we were sitting around? Yeah, so you know? I've never, I've, it's a story that obviously we're all storytellers and I think it struck a chord with uh, many specifically women around the world. Um, September last year, a 22-year-old woman um, called Mahsa Amini uh, was killed while she was in the custody of the morality police because she wasn't wearing her headscarf properly. Mm -hmm. she, still, she was wearing it, but it wasn't proper. Um, and uh, they, the Iranian authorities quickly said she, di she died of natural causes. She was, according to her family, she was a fit and healthy young woman, and it started an uprising. The next day at her funeral, women took off their headscarves and they started waving them in the air. And don't forget, compulsory hijab in Iran, if you don't abide by the rules, you end up in prison. A few days later, more and more protests. So, so there was a moment that many people in Iran, they looked at each other and they said, if we don't do something about this now, the next Mahsa could be me. And in fact, that, that's what they were chanting. And uh, we received an image, our newsroom is in London, we can't operate in Iran, we haven't had a reporter there for uh, 15 years. And we received a video from one of the protests in which a woman in one of the main squares of Tehran, the capital, was standing without a head headscarf in front of a water cannon. And she just stared at the driver, and the driver reversed. And another woman just uh, ran towards a police car and smashed it. And there was a moment that we thought, okay, this is big, mm -hmm. and this, is this means that things are shifting. Uh, there were four months of nonstop protests. Um, over 500 people have been killed. More than 20,000 people were put in prison. Um, dozens of people lost their eyes because of um, rubber bullets. But as you said, there's always hope. And the beauty of what they were doing can be seen in women who are now refusing to wear the headscarf when they go out on the street. We receive reports that in some cities, 80% of women have stopped wearing the headscarf despite the pushback from the government. They're now uh, refused to go on the tube uh, with, uh, with the headscarf. And sometimes the authorities say, no, you cannot get on the tube unless you put it on. And they say, okay, we'll walk. They can't go to government offices if they don't wear it. And they say, okay, we're not going to do it. So, Looking, for, looking six months later, we look at what happened in Iran and we feel that was our George Floyd moment. Mm -hmm. It moved so many women in the region. There were women in um, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, women in Syria, women in Turkey who were protesting and holding signs saying woman, life, freedom, which was the main slogan of Mahsa Amini's movement. And the reason there's hope is that we now look at these women who some of them have lost an eye in the protests. They were beautiful makeup. They're unfazed by what has happened to them. And they post photos of themselves on Instagram and they say, if you want to get rid of us, shoot us in the heart. Mm. We have two eyes, we used to have two eyes and we can live with one. Mm. Wow. And there's hope. And I think those are the real voices of change and they are fighting for democracy and they're so inspiring for the rest of us. 
So Alessandra, you know, I remember seeing what happened on January 6th. Yeah. In January 8th in our case. January yeah. 8th <laughs> in the case of Brasilia. Um, and also watching all of the videos because one of my best friends is Iranian and so getting connected with an Iranian women's WhatsApp, you know. But one of the questions is why didn't it, what happened with American women that they weren't kind of standing up in solidarity? And my question to Alessandra is, do you feel like what was happening in, in Iran at all made a connection to what's been happening in Brazil? Or are we in the terms of telling a story of mm -hmm. uprising? Did it not really connect and, and why? And tell us also what's going on right now in, in Brazil. Oh, what's going on in Brazil is always a in, in 30 seconds story. or less, right? <laughs> um, well, we, for the past four years, we had an, an, a far right authoritarian leader governing the country. Um, now, that, that could be, um, in many ways it is, the product of democracy itself. Bolsonaro was voted in by the majority of the Brazilian population uh, in a fair and free election. Of course, there are people who will say, not completely fair, not completely free, because there were, there were elements of that election that were different from previous elections, right? The main uh, opposition candidate, opposition to Bolsonaro was in jail, um, and it was also the first election that Brazilians had to cope with the tremendous weight of, of misinformation and fake news, et cetera, and that definitely played a role. But if you ask me, <laughs> I think that Bolsonaro's movement is an organic, popular movement that has real support in mm. Brazilian society, mm -hmm. which is what is worrisome about it, mm -hmm. um, because it is, a, it, is, it is something that we're not going to get rid of unless we really face this reality, which is we have a, a, a large chunk of Brazilian society today who does not actually believe in democracy, does not actually think that democracy is a value to be safeguarded, and they were ready to vote for a leader who very openly challenges democratic institutions and says publicly that he wished we still lived under a military dictatorship and that it wasn't really a dictatorship to begin with, et cetera. Mm. So that is a problem, right? Like, what do you do when democracy sort of eats itself from within? Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of what we saw during mm -hmm. those years. Now, of course, Bolsonaro lost the last election by a very tight margin, may I add. Very tight. We, our hearts almost stopped. I see Aurea in the audience. She's also used to be a politician, just like you, in, in the Brazilian Congress. She's succeeding me and Nasa very soon. And I think all of us who, who <coughs> lived through that moment, we were extremely worried. And, and now the, the election itself is being, is being uh, challenged. So there's a big chunk, again, of Brazilian society, but also politicians, leaders, business leaders, etc., who will openly say that the elections were not free and fair when there's no real um, there's nothing really to corroborate that claim. What happened on January 8th was very much inspired by the events in, on January 6th um, in the United States, and, and I think it comes to show that these sort of challenges to democracy, um, the, the movements that seek to challenge democratic institutions are very well connected, and they are feeding off each other and sort of replicating so many of the same tactics everywhere to the point where it even aesthetically looks very much like the same thing. Like if you look at the footage from January 6th mm -hmm. and then you look at the footage from January 8th, it's very, very similar. On the other hand, going back to Iran, I don't necessarily think that the movements that are pro-democracy mm -hmm. are as well connected mm -hmm. and are, are feeding off each other as well as, uh, as the ones who, who seek to challenge it. And that is a problem. So no, I don't know, I, don't, I cannot think of an wow. uprising in Brazil that was at all inspired, actually, by what was happening in Iran. Of course, the situation in Brazil is completely different, um, but we still, we, we are a country that has a number of laws that seek to um, keep women in their place, right? I mean, I could so, I, I could still, so yeah. see a movement we of solidarity could. of Brazilian women in support Absolutely. of Iranian women, and yet, you know, Absolutely. why not? So we're gonna talk a little bit more about story and what that matters, but this is great to set the stage. Erin, you're gonna go last because, you know, <laughs> the United States, it's yeah, so freaking yeah. complicated. <laughs> so, Lindy Wei, you know, as I was thinking about this um, and you um, from South Africa, um, which to me, when I was in college, of course, Nelson Mandela was still in prison. And so South Africa and his release became such a story of democratic hope right? 
And I'm just going to tell you a little story before I throw it to you. Um, I covered when Nelson and Winnie came to New York, and I was on 125th Street, the heart of Harlem at that time. You know, everybody thought, ooh, Harlem, so dangerous, so many black people, ooh. But what happened was that Nelson was on the corner of 125th and Adam Clayton Powell on a rise, and he said, and the streets were everywhere filled with people, and he said, the ANC needs your support. We need your money. We need your help. Send your dollars this way. And people started sending dollars across. The, they were like, here, pass this down to Nelson. And a sea of money, you know, just being flooded from one hand to another, which of course, the story is like Harlem is safe, right? Ain't nobody trying to take your money in Harlem, right? I live in Harlem, it's my community. But that is such a great story. I told it because I happened to be standing on top of a bus station stop, so I could see it all. But the other journalists were bigger and so they couldn't make it on top of the bus station stop, so they couldn't see it. <laughs> so tell us, uh, Lindy Wei, about um, the story of how we have to understand South Africa is still your position as an elected official in the opposition and now what you're doing, how we hold on to that story of hope and possibility from South Africa. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's a danger in being exceptional as a mm. story of hope and democracy that leads to a kind of complacency and a belief that you know, by virtue of the fact that we were so well celebrated internationally for the peaceful, quote unquote, transition, and it was not peaceful. Many people in South Africa died. My father was assassinated alongside many others in, in the peace. process of transitioning into, into democracy. So it was by no means peaceful, but this narrative that democracy was peacefully won in South Africa, that black and white came together, you know, under magnanimous circumstances, was kind of a very shaky foundation on mm. which to build a democracy. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't held because all of that motherhood and apple pie has not translated into a good life for South Africans, particularly for young South Africans. So inequality is still racialized. Your race is a predictor of whether you will eat a square meal tonight in South Africa, whether you'll have a decent education, whether you will be a victim of crime, one of the most beautiful cities in South Africa, the city of Cape Town, loved by tourists, is the crime capital of the country. But nobody knows because all that crime happens to black people in mm. townships. And that's not seen as part of Cape Town. Mm. So there's a kind of a two nation situation where people who are poor, people who are undereducated and were deliberately so under apartheid and then neglectfully so during the ANC's first sort of 20 odd years in government, um, cannot enter the job market, and so democracy, the, the promise of democracy has not delivered anything for them, materially. Mm -hmm. And then there are the incredibly wealthy, the middle class, those who are able to buy themselves out of government failure, economic failure, um, who are living large and actually have an extremely good life in that country. They make up 1%, uh, and in a broad definition, about 10%. So we often talk in South Africa about how Young people, unemployment among young people in South Africa is at 71% wow. at the moment. Young people is at 35 and under. Um, there's often talk about young people in South Africa being a ticking time bomb. Mm. But like, you can't be a ticking time bomb when you're hungry and when, you've, when you're 40s, you've never had a job before in your life and when you have to scrape by um, on a daily basis. So it's much more tragic than that. There's a danger that this beautiful democracy that was born out of 1994 which will be 30 years old next year, is kind of ossifying into a rotten promise that was never delivered. And so young Africans begin to think, well, what's this democracy mm -hmm. thing? Mm -hmm. What is it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do we need a yeah, dictator yeah. in power who yeah. will actually you know, make sure that you know, we d distribute wealth, that we you know, prevent uh, corruption, that we run the society in, which we, in the ways in which we want to? Because actually this self-determination nonsense where we all hold hands and we, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's the notion of what you were saying, delivered. Alessandra, and we'll come to you in a second, yeah. Aaron. Sorry. Right, which is, which is democracy. I mean, this has been a, yeah. an international project mm. 
that we have watched, we have all been a witness to, and it has happened in front of our faces. Yeah. Right? Go ahead, Anna. Well, we'll first of all, it's, it's like you're describing Brazil. Yep. It's <laughs> very scary. Yeah. But um, something you said really resonates with me. The story that democracy was, was created peacefully, yeah. it's the very same, it's exactly the same in Brazil, yeah. right? Like it's, oh, the, and, and I mean democracy in the broader sense, right? Like we abol we're the last country on earth to abolish slavery. Um, and what we're told when we're kids in, in schools in Brazil, is like, oh, slavery was abolished because the royal family signed this law. And there's like no sense of, of conflict. Mm -hmm. they, nothing was Struggle. won. Everything yes. was given. Yes. That's mm -hmm. what you're told, right? And in the, the end of the dictatorship, oh, there was an amnesty between the torturers and the guerrilla fighters. Mm -hmm. And no one went to jail, but you know, because it was just a fair thing to do. Everyone got an amnesty and it was just an agreement. And mm -hmm. we're told this story around how all of these things that we hold dear, our own democratic institutions, the fact that we don't enslave people anymore, or you know, at least not legally, um, that, that was a, a product of compromise, mm -hmm. when really it was people fighting for it with their lives and putting their lives on the line. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the crisis, right? If you don't tell the story of the conflict and the struggle, then when democracy is challenged again, we don't know that we need to we fight for it. Those resources right. again. Which is why yeah. we get to the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I was not born in the United States. I'm Mexican born, I'm, I'm an American citizen now. So the whole, I call myself a democracy junkie because we kind of believed in this, right? Coming from Mexico. And it is not a given. That is something that I have, I mean, I had to raise my hand in order to become an American citizen and say that I would take up arms to defend the United States. And I don't like guns, but I had to raise my right hand and say that. And yet, Aaron, all of us, I call what happened on January 6th um, a state of perpetual attempted coup d'etat mm -hmm. in the United States that still exists, mm -hmm. considering what we just witnessed in Nashville, for example. Right where two legislators were just stripped of their positions. Um, so Aaron, the story, you were saying if we don't tell that story, and yeah. the fact is, is that our democracy in the United States is being fought for right now, and our colleagues in the mainstream media are like, well, there's this side and that side, and we have to tell both sides, and it's all kind of on the same <laughs> yes. plane, and it's yes. like, it is not the same oh, thing. Yes. Exactly. Right. Uh, um, my, my mind is swirling um, just with the reactions and the, even the opening question. I, you know, some days I'm hopeful and some days I'm just pissed off. You know, um, I think, you know, when we think about the school shootings, when we think about these uh, two young gentlemen being expelled, um, when we think about the levers of democracy um, that essentially white supremacists in public office are using mm -hmm. and they are understanding how to pull and tug at those levers of democracy in order to um, create systems where voting begins to not matter, uh, to create systems where uh, re-election is 99% you know, likely, um, and to create environments where you end up with no choices on the ballot. You have one candidate running for this office. No one is even challenging that person. So I would, um, as we consider this conversation around voice and democracy, it's so much of that is rooted um, in how we tell the American story. We have a very similar, you know, I can look back at my, you know, elementary school textbook and what you learn about slavery in the United mm -hmm. States, um, the reaction to the 1619 Project, um, the way in which we are so unwilling to discuss the systems and structures that have been set up to benefit a singular group of people, white property owning men, from the beginning in the Constitution. Um, we just, we, we have not had that conversation um, and they are using political violence, political harassment, um, sexualized harassment for a lot of our women leaders. I'm sure you've all experienced it. It's sort of par for the course, unfortunately, right now. Um, so we're, we're in this muddle, I think, of um, needing actually really clear voices mm -hmm. to call out the absurdity. What was done in Tennessee was just absurd. It actually had no policy um, root. It wasn't in a party ideology. Um, you know, Trumpism isn't actually rooted in a series of thoughtful mm -hmm. um, debate about where he wants to take the country, right? Um, it's about the feelings that, um, quite honestly, you know, white men have about loss in the US. And guess who's their threat? Right, women so of I, color. I, I, I used to make a joke. I, I'm lucky I don't have to make it anymore since that man is not in power, but I would, I made a joke that I was five things that Donald Trump hated, right? 
So I'm Mexican, I'm an immigrant, I'm a journalist, I'm a woman, I'm flat-chested. <laughs> <laughs> the point is to make you laugh. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I, I because, am hopeful. Because, I do, I, it, we see it's, it, the local, um, and where we've focused in the US, the vote run lead is focused on the state legislatures. A couple of years ago, I had this hunch that you know, Congress had been doing nothing for quite some time prior to Trump. <laughs> you know, our, and there wasn't enough actual radical policy coming out of that. There are 700, excuse me, 7,383 state legislative seats. Um, roughly in 2022, 40% of those went uncontested. It is actually what we call laboratories of democracy in the US, so that out of those states actually comes a testing ground for really regressive or progressive yeah. public policy. And the, I think the sort of feminist movement has, um, the progressive movement, you know, writ large, hasn't actually looked at pulling those levers of democracy in the same way. We have the right stories, we believe the, the, the narrative is behind us, but we then don't have some of these strategic choices and we expect some of the storytelling, I think, to carry the weight. And it has to be the combination of deep storytelling and deep strategy and deep organizing that comes together. And that, Rana, and you're like, yes, but if we don't control the means of production of how we tell these stories, then yeah. it becomes complicated. And yeah, before and, you and start, before we get there. by the way, this is an interactive conversation. If you want to join in, raise your hand. You don't have to wait until the last 20 minutes. Raise your hand and somebody with a mic will come to you and we'll incorporate in you into this conversation. Go ahead. Before we get there, I want to inject some hope because when the protests in Iran were happening and an American friend of mine said, so Iranians are just getting killed and fighting for this to end up somewhere that they can choose someone like Trump. And Oof. I said, no. Uh, <laughs> it's just, Ooh, that's um, the narrative. Yeah, so they are, now we're questioning democracy, but yeah. My, I want to remind everyone that it can get much worse without democracy. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you're, you have a proper constitution in the United States, you can actually, the, the debate is about transgender uh, lavatories. The debate in Iran and many countries in the Gulf are about when, uh, your, your choice to what to wear. Women are not allowed to dance. Women are not allowed to sing. So um, it's, we have to, obviously democracy mm. is sacred and a lot of people have been killed for us to get there. Yeah. But, and we have to fight to, to uh, save it. But without it, life is much worse. You can be ruled by unelected people who mm -hmm. can be in power for decades, and you can't remove them. Unlike Trump, people didn't like him. He can be removed after four years. He might leave uh, uh, some da uh, damages uh, behind him, but at least you have some foundation for your democracy. We're, we're decades behind that. I don't know, some of us in the United States yeah. feel like, yes, but, yeah. right? You know, just like, yes, but, and, and we have to hold on to that. Exactly what you've said, Rana, is what we have to hold on to. But frankly, the misogyny and the uh, white supremacy, right, that we face, even in the coverage of trying to cover a story of getting more women to run, uh, most of, overwhelmingly, all of the media in the United States is owned and operated by white, cis men uh, of privilege, presenting heterosexual. And presenting, funding the far right. You heard that. Yeah. I heard that. <laughs> presenting heterosexual, and then making all of the decisions vis-a-vis -vis from that perspective. Yeah. So again, I remind you, you can interrupt each other. Go ahead, Lindy Wei, and raise your hands if you have a question. The problem with this narrative that we need to look for examples of democracy from the West right. is precisely yeah. Donald Trump or Boris Johnson, who's now implicated in bribe, bribe, bribing people in order to gain access to six million odd pounds yeah. worth of you know, dubious cash, or Bolsonaro, or Duterte. Um, but critically, when we look at the North, Italy, you know, the UK, uh, the United States, those are not the countries we can turn to and say to our people, exactly. these are examples of democracy. Exactly. Because what the authoritarians, the Russians who are taking over militaries all over the African continent, uh, the Chinese government who've got diplomats whispering in the ears mm -hmm. of politicians, ah, this Western concept of democracy, is it right for you? Is it culturally appropriate? They are using those Western narratives of democratic failure or democratic problem 
problems to bolster their narrative that we should do things differently. And people who have been failed by the democratic project are listening and they're saying, maybe we should do things Correct. differently. Maybe we do need a, a Paul Kagame in power. You know, people like him are elevated as examples of, you know, democracy versus freedom. I mean, freedom versus development. If you don't have freedom, you can have mm -hmm. development, right? Mm -hmm. That's the narrative, mm -hmm. this pernicious narrative that is making its way across the continent. And it's not helped by the fact that in countries in the global north, which are supposed to be democratic lodestars, mm -hmm there have been some very poor you know, examples of democratic outcomes. So for me, it's no longer about that conversation about the US. I don't want to center conversations about democracy on Correct. the US. I don't think it's the US's job to hold democracy summits on every continent. It is not an example of a good democracy at the moment. I mean, right? who holds so, the United States so accountable for what they're doing? So what the question is, is what right. do we do? What do we do in the global south to define, to set standards, mm -hmm. and to demonstrate excellence in democratic governance, accountability, transparency, and so forth? Not on our own terms by changing the goalposts, but by defining them using African countries, African faces, African dem de Democrats, Af African governments. And likewise in the you know, South Asia and East Asia, and all other parts of the world, Latin America or, uh, and the Middle East, where, where democracy should be thriving, we need to be able to find examples that look more like Correct. us and that are successful, that don't center the West as a definition or the arbiter of what a democracy should look like. And I think that's the conversation we have to think through because the concept of democracy is in so much peril at the moment. We need to be a little bit more creative about what the narratives about good democracy okay. look like. Uh, okay, we have a couple of questions here. Let's go right here. We'll hear your question right behind you. Yeah. Thank you so much. My name is um, Abosede, and I look after a women's leadership organization in Nigeria. I just wanted to piggyback off Lindiwe's point because Nigeria has just come out of an election that happened in February and in March. And I have to say, in our 20-something years of democracy, seven cycles later, it wasn't our best moment, but it was definitely the freest and fairest election we have had. Hold on because we applied technology that had to verify everyone who voted. Now, prior to this, goats and cows voted in Nigeria. However, and dead people. Yes, and dead people in the register. Mm -hmm. However, I wanted to piggyback on that point because the narrative in the global media mm -hmm. was terrible right. about mm -hmm. this election. Bearing in mind that Nigeria is the largest democracy in Africa, it was going to be the largest election on the continent mm. this year. Mm. And I thought that the international media missed an opportunity to at least indicate that cons considering what was happening on the continent, mm. where there are now you know, coup d'etats everywhere, mm -hmm. we actually had an election. Mm -hmm. mm. Do you see what I mean? Like people had an opportunity to make a choice mm -hmm. about who their leader would be, right? And yes, you know, the person won with 8 million votes versus, you know, a combination of 12 million that he lost out of the total votes. But my point is, the way that the narrative was pushed really just lends credit to the fact that even the media is somewhat falling for this pushing the failure of mm, democracy yeah. mm. without knowing. Mm. And, you know, we had internal conversations about you know, confirmation bias about how people have created echo chambers as yes. journalists, mm -hmm. and they want to push that narrative. I mm -hmm. mean, even the fact that a lot of the polls were saying this particular candidate was going to win, and that didn't happen, almost became a way that we have to preserve our integrity, mm -hmm. because as an international media newspaper that is known for credibility, we predicted that as well. Mm -hmm. But this wasn't what happened, mm -hmm. and we have to discredit the process as a result. So I just wanted to, to lend my voice. Uh, you know, Aaron, white men <laughs> in the United States are not threatened by white supremacy. So therefore, the conversation about covering an election in Africa that is hopeful, they're just like within the context, like, well, what does that really mean? And I find, again, that journalists, they continue to uh, partake in this narrative of, well, democracy, question mark, because they're like, well, we'll still be okay, 
as mm. white men, we'll, we'll still make it through an authoritarian white supremacist regime. Yeah, we'll be okay. Exactly. And therefore, that taints the way in which they cover these stories. Um. <laughs> right? I mean, it's so interesting. I mean, my husband is Igbo, so we followed the Nigerian election in our home quite closely. Um, and the, he couldn't find the news anywhere. You know, it was sort of local sources, Twitter, Instagram, friends, WhatsApp groups. Um, and I mean, I, I sort of laughed and felt the same way often about our work because mm. what's coming out of some of the places that are hopeful and some of the stories that I do want to actually see shared globally mm. are places like Minnesota and Michigan, where you actually saw in the legislature a concerted effort of mostly women of color get elected. The Minnesota legislature had no black women in the, in the state Senate. Actually, 18 states in our democracy have no black women in their state Senate. Um, and it's not reflective of the populations in that state. Um, three black women got elected to the state Senate. The majorities changed, mostly within the Democratic Party. And you saw in Michigan and Minnesota a wave of legislation that came out. Feminist legislation that was um, support, is going to help the economy. Uh, Minnesota will be a haven for trans kids. Mm -hmm. um, just really powerful stuff that were these sort of windows of what it would actually look like mm -hmm. if we had reflective democracies. Mm -hmm. um, and it is not, the, you know, sort of, there's 1% of the population, so you must be 1% of the government. It is about POV. It is about perspective. It is about how I have lived my life differently than you with weights on me that you have not lived, and therefore I can make different choices and see different solutions. Um, and so I, what I don't want coming out of the U.S. is only this conversation that is dominated by white men, is only this sort of you know, con connected fiber of the sort of Rupert Murdochs and the Trumps of the world. Uh, what I do want to see actually better covered is uh, you know, the vote count that the Evo guy got in Lagos. I want to see better covered is the, you know, the, the really powerful wave of never before seen legislation like missing and murdered indigenous women that is getting copied now in other legislatures, that is getting copied for missing and murdered black women. Mm -hmm. um, so those, those kind of voices and those kind of stories we're not finding enough outlets for. Um, so I don't know what to do about the men. I mean, I call myself a replacer. Like my job is literally to replace them yeah. in the legislature. I want them to retire. I want to shame the shit out of them. I want them to go away. They've been there for 20, 25 years. You, sometimes their bio photograph is them like in their 40s. And then you meet them and you're like, that is not you, right? Um, those, it, we have to look up and actually see who these folks are, They're, they are very replaceable. Thank yeah. you for your service, it is time to move on. Yeah. Uh, so interesting because, um, because I, I see you. Um, oh, you're just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because as a Mexican immigrant, in fact, when we heard the protest of you will not replace us mm -hmm. yeah. in the white supremacist uh, march that they had, and I was like, bruh, interestingly. I was like, I don't want to replace you. Mexicans aren't coming here. Immigrants aren't coming here to replace you. We want to hang out with you. We want to party with you. We want to fall in love with you. We want to employ you. We want to be your neighbors. But so it's just like when you say we do want to replace you, I'm a little bit like, ah. Uh. <laughs> I mean, they have an overwhelming share of everything. Yeah. I mean, you know? yes. So I, that's at this why point, it's like, do, go do something else. I think, that's, <laughs> I think that's a perfectly legitimate approach. And I think we have to have the same approach in Africa. Average age is 19. Yeah. Most of our presidents are in their 70s and 80s. They've been in power since they were in their 30s, and they were fresh-faced and revolutionary, and they've now ossified into dictators, criminals, and, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we do want to replace them. But we also want to have more diversity of leadership. So we're not saying all old leaders must leave the Correct. fray. There is room for political elders who have got equal levels of commitment to democratic outcomes as young people and also young people and women are not necessarily like perfect as the driven snow mm -hmm. right so what we're tr what we're aiming for is a broad diversity in our leadership that will reflect what our societies look like but that diversity could also include women who are misogynists young Correct. people who are dictators etc etc et so it's not as simple as as Correct. you know just replacement theory but i do think given the overwhelming numbers of minority groups who have access to massive amounts of power, we do have to think in terms of, you know, once these guys shuffle off, or once, you know, their positions come up for re-election, who's contesting for power in order to make sure that once the election's over, the demographics of this legislature or this country's leadership look different. So there's two words that we, that actually are banned in my newsroom. 
and I don't like the word band, but there are two words. We don't use the term minority to refer to minorities in the United States because I think that that's a, thank you, I think that that's a psychological play. We're not the minority. Sorry, I was not referring to racial minorities. I was referring to old people in Africa who are a minority. <laughs> <laughs> I'm referring to men in Africa who are a minority. Dude. That's what I'm talking about. Merci beaucoup. They are a small group with outsized power. Right. Dude. And it's unrepresentative. That's what I'm referring to. The other word that's banned in my newsroom is illegal to refer to a human being. Yep. Yeah. We never use the term illegal to refer to a human being. I see two hands up. If it's possible, if we can get one, two to just ask your question really quickly and then throw it back and if you have a question raise it but let's just get those two questions very quick all right um, thank you so much for everything you've said so far i think it's great to have some hope injected into this conversation because i think so much of it is so dark um, so my name is simon taylor i'm one of the founders of global witness we've had quite a lot of fun and games with various dictators around and investigated <laughs> them and exposed them and so on um, i had a question slightly tilting the conversation a bit, but um, to what extent, I, I feel that this may be the case because we capture the, the consequences, if you like, but to what extent do you feel the current, I would describe it as predatory form of capitalism, mm -hmm. free market fundamentalist capitalist model, which is expanding inequity everywhere, mm -hmm. to what extent is that a key factor mm -hmm. in undermining what we may aspire to have in a genuine democracy, a genuine, accountable, open society. Thank you. Thank you, and you have another question right next to you with the gentleman, go ahead and stand up. Yeah. Adam Smith, the Thomas Reuters Foundation, and I was literally about to ask the exact same thing. <laughs> All right, well, great minds think alike. I see right behind you there's a question, so go ahead and ask the question. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I have a small question and a small comment on what um, Apostle said, and I don't want to make this a Nigerian conversation. <laughs> And to be honest, this is just, a, and I understand uh, the way the elections went. There was a groundswell of young people who came out and said, we want to be participatory, we want to be in this election. And they, and they expected institutions to be institutions. And, and a lot of things that when democracies break down, it starts from when institutions are hijacked by political interest. And it was just the evidence, because you had the INEC chairman, which is the electoral chairman in Nigeria, came to DC came to London, spoke everywhere about how this election was going to be speak and span, thoroughly transparent. And we are all going to vote, and we're all going to look into the servers on the internet, and we're going to see our results sheet there. And I tracked that election at every polling local government coalition center. And for 12 hours, politicians held results hostage, thinking in their head, how do we manipulate things? So by the time results came on the platform, was manipulated, it was mutilated. And, and that is the biggest argument against democracy. I don't think young people in Nigeria didn't want to lose elections. If you're a Democrat, you must be ready to lose elections. But you want to lose in a fair way. Mm. And I think what has happened, I don't know where we're going to. I don't think we would regress, like become maybe a military regime or coup either. I'm just saying that we also have a, a, a role as people who are frontline leaders in countries to put pressures on institutions to remain independent mm -hmm. institutions because those are these guardrails of democracy. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, who wants to jump in? Capitalism and institutions. Go ahead, I, Alison. I can jump in on the capitalism question because I was thinking about the same thing. So thank you for asking the question. If we conflate as so often we have done, and when I say we, I mean sort of the, the public narrative, right? If you conflate a very specific form of capitalism with democracy, we are going to lose democracy. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we're going to lose democracy through democratic means, most likely, because there's no way in the world a majority of the world's people are going to choose this. Right? It's just not, it's not possible. So unless you create ways around the will of the people, which in itself erodes democracy and democratic mm -hmm. institutions at their core, it's just not going to hold. And so many, when we say that democ democracy is failing to deliver, mm -hmm. I do wonder how much of it is a democratic failure, how much yeah. of it is just Economic capitalism mm -hmm. is failing to deliver on mm -hmm. some really important things, including the possibility of life on Earth for the next mm -hmm. few decades, mm -hmm. um, including equity and justice and all of these other values mm -hmm. that are really central to so many people, even if they don't necessarily voice it in that way. Mm -hmm. And when you see a movement like the movement that elected Bolsonaro, it's very strange, right? Because 
sometimes that movement was, it, it, it had the support of a good chunk of the business community in Brazil, oh. more than it should have had, right? Yeah. But it also had the support of voters from very popular backgrounds who are pissed off at the fact that they don't have enough opportunity in their lives. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily conflate that lack of opportunity with failures of capitalism, capitalistic mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. They conflate it with democracy because what they've been told is that you cannot have one without the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That you cannot have democracy unless you buy into this full package, which includes yep. a very specific form of capitalism mm -hmm. uh, that is just not delivering, that mm -hmm. I agree is not delivering. Mm -hmm. so, as, as, we, as we think about this, we're gonna have to think about how we, in the public narrative, in the way that we tell these stories, we disentangle these two things. Mm. Capture of democratic institutions by economic forces is also a product of endless accumulation of wealth. Mm -hmm. There's no way in the world where we're gonna have people with so much wealth that are not exerting that wealth right. mm -hmm. in the democratic sphere. It's just mm -hmm. not possible. Mm -hmm. Our democratic institutions were, are not actually built for this form mm -hmm. of predatory capitalism. They're not, because they're not mm -hmm. immune to that level of concentration. Now, there are many things that we can do about that. It, and I, I'm a firm believer that the only way to move forward is through the democratic process, because, and I, I wanted to go back to something mm -hmm. that you said, which really resonated with me, I come from a country that wasn't a democracy just 30 years ago, mm -hmm. right? So when I, when, when I hear stories about the struggle for democracy, these are not like old timers. <sighs> these are my parents. Mm -hmm. my, 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 my mother and my father grew up in a country where there was no freedom mm -hmm. to, to discuss. Like just the other day, my mom was telling me like she went to a Catholic school and one, of, one day one of the nuns went missing mm. <laughs> because she was, I don't know, telling the kids something that shouldn't be telling the kids. It was probably not, not even like a radical thing, but that's what happens, right? So I am, I, I, I hear people when they say democracy is failing, but one, I really think that we should disentangle that from the economic systems that are failing us mm -hmm. and the forms of production that are failing us. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. And the second thing is, even when democracy fails, the fact that we have a process to address those failures, that is not just a few men in a room deciding on what to do with that mm -hmm. is to me a really big win. I'm not willing to give up on that. Mm -hmm. and one more thing before, before I forget on the US conversation, totally hear you, mm -hmm. completely agree. We need to sort of look at other examples and build our own practice of what democracy means. At the same time, I really do believe, and I'm not alone in saying this, that if the Biden administration hadn't signaled to Brazil just now that it would not buy into a coup in Brazil, Bolsonaro would have gone for it. Right. So having administration, an administration in the US that values democracy, at yeah. least to some extent, yeah. is really, really vital to some of the other democracies in the world because for all, you know, we can, we can lament it, but the fact of the matter is the United States remains the most powerful country in the world, so, and at least in Latin America, that has a huge influence, and it has had a bad influence for many, many years. And you know, but now, I think, you know what yeah. the second largest voting population group in the United States is right now are Latinos and Latinas. Yes. And the most common age of Latinos and Latinas in the United States right now is 11. There you go. So when we talk about what's gonna happen in the future, it's in the hands. That's why I'm like, you think I'm just talking about Latinos, because, and I'm like, it's about saving democracy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for the United States. Aaron you know, and then Rana, for you know sure. I'm, so in the US, the other R word that people aren't gonna like is regulation. We have sort of deregulated the political industrial complex that is a billion dollar industry mm -hmm. from, you know, sort of consultants on K Street to the fundraising limits that are getting raised. I mean, the amount of fundraising and the, the billions of dollars, it was something, um, my numbers are going to be probably off by a few billion, but it was something like eight to 10 billion got, you know, on the presidential and another like six to eight billion got spent on local elections. It's an insane amount of money that is coming from a very small group of players, you know, we, we have these sayings that sort of field, field beats fundraising, field beats money in any day, right? That the people power of organizing does work. The um, state Supreme Court race in Wisconsin just recently mm -hmm. shows that, right? Young people organized on those campuses. Um, this young man, Teddy, that I, I used to work with, organized those campuses with, with people power. But we cannot be depleting the resources of people when we're fighting the resources of, of what is this capital that is just fle like flowing mm -hmm. so freely. Um, and, and we have to regulate that. There has to be better campaign finance laws in the US. I mean, 
the FCC should be slapping more on Fox, right? We need this sort of regulation, and we need stronger champions to have teeth, that regulation to have teeth. They have quietly deregulated a lot of that. Um, any of the campaign finance laws are getting, they're slowly getting gutted. One of the solutions I do see to that at a very tactical level is something called ranked choice voting, um, which we are seeing sprout up across the US, which is a method in which you can vote for your top three, top five candidates. Um, and you saw it in the New York mayoral race. Um, some of the women that had very small fundraising compared to the gentlemen, the two gentlemen that had quite a bit of fundraising, um, were able to stay in the race and be in the conversation because they were consistently ranked second. Right? They were sort of everyone's second choice. Like, if you liked him, you also liked her. But if you liked him, you also liked her. So uh, it is a bit of an um, equalizer. Uh, so we, when we think about some of the systems that we, how we participate and vote in, ranked choice voting is one of those things that we're seeing that diminishes the power of large campaign contributions. I just want to bring you in what you're kind of how you're sensing this conversation. I want to add to the problem with capitalism. Um, so there are several other problems. I think we are the lack of education and not lack of funding in proper education early on um, is another reason why that democracy is now giving ground to, to uh, far right movements because people are not aware of who to vote for and why it's important to take part. The other problem with democracy is that I think it makes people a bit lazy. Uh, they're, they're a bit complacent. They just think, OK, we've, we've reached there. We can now go back to our lives. But the fact is that with all these uh, examples that we see, you cannot go back to living your life. You can't uh, say that this is no longer my responsibility. We reached the, the, the goal, and we can go and, and live our lives. Um, we, we have to continue to fight for it. Otherwise, it can easily sway on yes. the other way around. So, so Rana, can you just, I'm going to ask everybody if you can give us a story of hope one very particular story that it's a symbol for you of democratic engagement of the possibility. Again, I go back to what I'm reporting on now, which is Caitlin, mm. 11 years old, eh, running rallies at the state capitol in Austin and just speaking this truth. And I'm, I, I mean, I tell her, I'm like, I really want you to be the governor of Texas. Mm -hmm. And she's probably like, I want to be a Hollywood star. You know, but I'm hoping that planting that seed means that she will consider, right, running for the governor of Texas. But let's just go around. Rana, we'll start with you. Some a story again. We're talking I want to give story. you two stories. Okay. One story was three days ago that went viral in Persian social media. A woman had gone to an officially official registry office and she was refused service because she wasn't wearing the headscarf. And in protest, she put a plastic bag over her head. I said, OK, now it's covered. Uh, and that went viral. And it has created a lot of conversation about how men and women continue to, to push back and protest uh, for, for these basic freedom, to, which to the rest of us is, is so, so um, easy to have. But another uh, woman that is very inspiring is a woman called Sepide Qulian. She's from south of Iran. She is a workers' rights activist. Uh, she comes from a very religious part of the country. She has uh, dyed her hair blue, and she's got such spark in her eyes. And there are so many videos of her standing in front of these workers' uh, protests and giving very heated speeches. And most of the workers were men. Uh, she was arrested a few years ago, uh, and uh, a couple of weeks ago she was released. And she was received with so many of her followers at uh, prison gates with flowers. She left the uh, prison without the headscarf. And as soon as she was released, she started chanting, saying that, hey, you dictator, we're going to bring you down. Within three hours, she was re uh, arrested again. She's back in prison. And she said that because she doesn't uh, believe in the Iranian judicial system, she is not going to trial. And she's happy to stay in prison. Yes. And she's only 25, I think, 23, 24. Uh, and look at, looking at these kind of women, well, she, she's probably similar to the 11-year-old that uh, you want to see in power. I think there's so many examples of young women who just want to live a normal life. Mm and are ready to, to risk it. And they've already been in prison. So they're no longer scared of mm. anything. And they are the people that I think will, will fight for the future of Iran. And hopefully, we can, we can see, we can hear more, more about them in the future. Lindiwe, a story, a positive, uplifting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we got this. So um, I'm going to answer this question by saying two things. The first is, in our organization, we have many, many stories of incredible young people who have transitioned out of social movements, out of the private sector, out of community leadership, and have either run for office or are planning to run for office or are serving in government. 
What we know from our work is that the appetite amongst young, pe young people to lead is extremely high. Mm -hmm. The only barrier to entry is the opacity of the political system, right? There's a ton of gatekeeping that takes place in order to keep talented people out. Mm -hmm. But I want to push back slightly against this stories of hope thing, because I think we get addicted to profiles in courage <coughs> and we don't address systemic issues. Mm. And I think I come from a country where profiles in courage were very addictive mm. and it became, you know, I was a profile in courage when I was in office, right? A young black woman leading in parliament. And then we, we all got addicted to the idea that the natural trajectory for the country was positive change. Yeah. Instead, of, instead of saying, okay, this is a story in a particular context, but what are the systemic issues that we're having to deal with? And for me, the fact that a woman is in jail because of the way she presents her hair, the fact that women cannot access services because of their refusal to participate in a particular re religious dogma, that's the systemic problem. Mm -hmm. And yes, there may be profiles in courage, but there are far, far more people who must live with that drudgery every single day. So my interest is in how can we get people like this, courageous individuals, in power? How can we give them political power? How can we give them the resources, the institutional authority to be able to change these systemic challenges instead of us only celebrating activism from the outside? So that's why our work is really, really focused on politics. You know, if, if government is a big wheel, politics is the lever, you know, and it's held by political leaders. And we can celebrate amazing civil society activism, wonderful business uh, initiatives and so forth that take place out of the government sphere. But until we can get these incredibly talented people, these great voices, into the decision-making spaces, we're, really, uh, we're gonna be kind of throwing stones from the outside at a much bigger system where you know, the people who are working to do the opposite are tackling these things at an institutional level. Right. So, I, you know, that, you know, let's... Okay, we need a huddle. Me, you, you, <laughs> you. We need a meeting in there after. Post, post, post. What I'm trying to say is let's get to scale. Yes. Before we start congratulating ourselves about yeah. how well <laughs> we are, how courageous we are about, yeah. So that's the first thing I want to do. My colleague, Dr. Stembi Lembeta, is sitting in the audience right here. <laughs> and one of the things she often says um, when she and I are... I love my job because I get to spar with this incredibly intelligent woman <laughs> and come up with ideas for how we structure programs, how we solve problems, and how we show up as an organization in this discourse. And one of the things she loves to say about why we need to change the narrative on democracy in Africa is that liberal democracy kind of has us in a chokehold mm. as the only form of democracy. And the notion of liberal democracy is coupled with kind of open markets, Bretton Woods institutions, uh, you know, credit rating agencies that look differently at some countries versus others, right? All of these systems that are West-leaning, West-designed, West-headquartered, and define democracy as a system of institutions rather than as a philosophy of self-determination coupled with other social norms is one of the reasons that we struggle to kind of recenter the conversation on what democracies should look like. Mm. It's one of the reasons seats in parliaments and congresses have a sticker price, mm -hmm. right? Beto O'Rourke spending a billion US dollars yep. on a seat for governor that he lost. I don't understand <laughs> that. How does that work, right? So it, the infiltration of capital in politics, but also the ability of capital to make people extraordinarily wealthy while engendering inequality within countries and around the world is part of the problem. And it's this idea that we have to couple the notion of democracy with liberal, and that the word liberal isn't a philosophy, it's about a series of particularly, you know, financial and sort of economic governance institutions. You know, the IMF meetings are happening right now while we sit here. All of that is kind of built into this notion of liberal democracy. Yeah. And if we are going to make democracy sticky, resilient, we've got to be able to accommodate different types of democracy that preserve accountability, transparency, self-determination, and so forth, but don't prize certain ways of doing business, for example, over others, because right. that's where we start to aim. Not being afraid to have the conversation mm -hmm. about, let's look at democracy critically, it isn't just one thing that yeah. is you know, under the purview of George Washington's eyes, right? <laughs> this illusion that we have. We've got like three minutes. 
And we've got the two of you to end up with, I don't know, Lindy Way's like, it's not about hope. And I'm like, OK. <laughs> but I do want to try and. That's why and, you should and, not and never speak after a politician. It's just <laughs> <laughs> Alessandra, a story. In 30 seconds, I just want to say that I, I completely agree that getting people in power is absolutely central. I also don't believe in agency or perfect agency from people in power. Mm -hmm. People who are in power suffer pressure mm -hmm. from all sides, from their political parties, from their campaign donors, from their constituents. And actually, the constituents are the, are the ones who apply pressure the less, mm -hmm. who are less organized to do that. Uh, and so I, do, I am a firm believer in activism and organizing on the ground because I actually think that that creates the political space for the people that we elect to actually do the things that we want them to do. Otherwise, they can't do it. Right? Like they have to respond to whomever is pressuring them because that's just how it works. So that's one thing. The, my, my hopeful story is about someone who is in power now. Um, four years ago, the year that Bolsonaro was elected, four and a half years, 2018, um, Marielle Franco, who was, a who was a, in the local Congress for Rio, for my home state, who was also a close friend and someone who I deeply loved and admired, was assassinated. And we lost her, which is an immense loss. Um, sorry. Okay, <laughs> I She's anyway, with us. Um, we lost her. And at the time, her sister, Anieli, was not in politics at all. She was a volleyball player and a journalist. And that's what she wanted to do. And she answered the call for essentially making Marielle's legacy live on. So she created an institute in her sister's memory and started encouraging more women of color to go into office and actually follow in her sister's footsteps. And at the time, I thought, this is crazy. She was just killed. This is the biggest signal that you shouldn't do this, that if you are, if your body is that vulnerable that it would allow, we would allow you to be killed and we still don't know how that happens and who ordered that crime. Who is gonna wanna do this now? And I was completely wrong because she actually got a lot of women to run and to, to occupy those spaces um, in spite of the challenges, in spite of the violence and the threats. And just two months ago, she was made Minister of Racial Equality in Brazil. So she's there. So now she does have she does have the authority, right, to turn some of these yeah. um, some of these programs into policy to really do it from a position of power and authority and a budget and the government apparatus, and we're just so thrilled for her. So that's my story. And you know what? No, 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 Mamita. I'm so glad I didn't cry because usually <laughs> I'm the one who's crying. To me, the the emotional connection is essential. Yeah. It is absolutely essential, and I don't diminish it at all. This is one of the things that people will talk about. What happened here, right, is that we saw this emotional connection to democracy. Because <laughs> we're democracy junkies. Erin, you've got two minutes to take us out on a story that does not center the United States, but also centers hope. OK. Um, <laughs> I, it's actually, it's, a, it's my friend Ilhan Omar, um, who, it, you see how she just dropped that? It's her friend. She's my friend. I'm so lucky that she's my friend. Um, I'm so lucky to to know her, um, to to you know to know her um, because she's a human being, and the way I think that she's she's vilified, um, the threats to her, the constant threats to her safety, um, the way she has handled herself, um, not just being removed from a committee by a bunch of idiots, um, but the you know the op-ed in the New York Times. Um, you know, forgiving the man who wanted to kill her. Um, there is a, a grace and a poise in this woman who, you know, had said to me one time sitting in her office, like, I survived a civil war. You know, they can come, they can come for me as much as they want. Um, I know how to be a minority in the minority, she said a few weeks ago. I know how to legislate. Um, the way that her floor speech where she said, I'm an American, and you saw um, Congresswoman Cori Bush behind her, you saw the squad, right? Um, these, are, these are global women who have global backgrounds, who wore their traditional clothing to their congressional ceremonies. Um, and I think they're my go-to. They're, they're the t-shirt I wear at night, you know, to sleep in. They're like, okay, ladies, let's, let's do this. Um, and I, I, whenever I do think of sort of hard things, um, you know, Maria asked us for a song. You know, my, one of my, so the song I had shared is something like, you know, like when you give up, you're like, no, F it, I'm gonna go, you know, I'm gonna continue. Um, I think of 
I think of folks like Ilhan, who, who continue to persevere, who connect the dots to the global community, um, and who are risking their lives to make our democracy better. And you know, people look at Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and they just see this threat. And actually for me, I see Alexandria or Ilhan, and it's just like, these are the most fascinating politicians. Yes. Forget that they're women, forget that they're women who are not yes. white. It's just, they are the most fascinating so politicians savvy. who are so savvy and who do, who do although in the way already, it's like, don't hold up hope. We're gonna, we're, we are gonna hold up hope even though it's gonna, <laughs> no, 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 we got but you. It, it matters we, that there wait, were wait, four wait, of I, them. I feel it like matters have, that they were a squad. I have to be very, you know? very clear. Like, I am enormously inspired by, by all, the, all the women you've just spoken about. But the trend hasn't changed. Yeah. They still make up 26% But it takes of time. Women. So it's I a, want I, I want just think everywhere we look, there's hope. And we, we just have to be, uh, we're grateful for these I, women. And it's, it's a process. I want us to turn hope into action mm. instead yes. of becoming OK with mm. hope. That's all mm. I'm Instead saying. of just becoming a profile. Instead of being yeah. comfortable with, 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 with hope as, as something that will sort of naturally carry us. Mm. We, we actually have to turn that hope into sustainable action, I make agree. sure these women who end up in office yes. can Im implement their, you know, their plans of action, that they are resilient, that they are supported, that they aren't just symbols that make it yeah. easier for us to deal with the complexity of the world. Listen, I, um, <clears throat> if it wasn't for, for the fact that it's sunny, <laughs> and that we would end up by dancing, putting on the full volume of the music, but I know people are going to want to talk, but to me, this does end up being incredibly hopeful. It is an incredibly complex conversation about democracy, but I'm telling you, I am not giving up no matter how upset I get, no matter how <laughs> sad I get, um, I am not giving up. And I just want to say thank you to Lindy Way, to Alessandra, to Rana, to Aaron, to all of you, and to Stoll for bringing us together. This has been beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you.